Hey there, welcome to a really late show with Chris and Craig. I'm Chris, got Craig with me. Craig, we're just talking a busy day, man. Yeah, as never always. Slows down. It? <laughs> it never does, does it? Yeah, but, but it's good. We're here. Uh, we like what we do. It, yeah. it keeps us busy sometimes, but we like what we do, and we're fortunate to have what we have. Um, but um, let's talk about some more news, man. Um, my uh, website, Mahoney Matters, um, did a story uh, talking about the TikTok ban. Obviously, that's something that's out there. Um, you might say, why would anybody ban TikTok? Well, it's run by China. There's some assertions that your information isn't quite as safe. And uh, there's some concerns about where would your information go and everything. I don't know, Craig. I'm a little confused about this because is this the same allegation that's thrown around about Twitter and the same allegation that uh, some a lot of people say about Facebook? Is your privacy really is that safe wherever you go? I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Um, it's, it's really hard to get a grasp on some of this stuff with Twitter and TikTok and what's private, what's public. It, it just seems like you just either do it or you don't do it at this point, you know. And and you think to yourself, do do people in other countries care what I'm doing, you know, on 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 those apps? Maybe they are. I don't know. But, yeah, that's kind of the way I, I begin to look at it, really, to be honest with you. Well, if you buy into the theory, and, again, I'm not saying this is conspiracy theory. I don't know, man. I don't have time to cover that part of it. But, you know, some people will say, look, China, you know, it's they're scary. China could use things for the bad purposes. Right. Well, okay, if that's true, it could be. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, maybe it's good that on the government phone, you probably shouldn't use TikTok. I, I can buy into that. I'm right. not saying I'm for it, but I don't think that's so crazy. But right. I'll be honest, man. I mean, we're journalists. We do a podcast. I, I don't think there's huge interest in our personal, you know, private information. I mean, if there is, we're doing stuff right. But, I, you know, and we're probably more known than your typical Joe. So, Right. Yeah, I mean, if, if you got banned on government phones, that makes sense. There's probably a lot of stuff that you should do on government phones that people do anyway. Right. So that's great. But I don't know. I, I just don't see how, why this is such a big deal. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's really kind of confusing at this point. Like, what what's the big deal? I You know, maybe I could see the, the government phone type of thing. But even still, you know... What's the, you know, what, what are you, I mean, are you really, do you have trade secrets, you know, as government employees on your phone? Maybe you do, but I would think that your employer, the United States government, would probably have firewalls, VPNs, some kind of protection that would, you know, prohibit easy access to things like that if other countries wanted to try and hack into a government phone and because i would imagine that most people that have government jobs especially ones that would be worth you know trying to hack into probably have a government issued phone and they only do their government business on said phone so at the end of the day you can make those phones pretty sealed tight in terms of their their access and i would just think that it would be a challenge to hack into a government protected phone, much like it would be trouble, you know, hard to hack into the government, you know, missile codes and things like that, you know, that I would think it, they would make it challenging. I don't want to go all like Joe Rogan conspiracy theory on yet, but I, I think there's a growing fear that people just don't like IT people really aren't getting what they need to get. Um, I was at a um, support group meeting for kids parents of kids with special needs. And there was some talk, and I, I won't mention the school name here, but there was some talk that parents went to a administrator because kids were accessing porn on, on a school system. Okay. And pretty much the superintendent, yeah, he, they cared, but their answer was, can you help us figure this out? And I'm like, don't you have IT people and everything? And I know a school district, is, I'm sure, is less secure than the government. But I think there's a lot of places that we're behind on IT wise. I mean, maybe yeah. we're more vulnerable. I, I, I heard um, uh, why was it being talked on the 
well, it wasn't Pat McAfee. It was some other podcast that's listening today where they're talking about the, um, there's more voice deep fakes. So like if you're on a podcast like this, or if, if you have speeches or like a pastor that's online a lot, um, they can take your voice and they can call with your voice. Like, so they can call your mom or they can call some other family member with you saying, I need money. And, and you know, when they, they say where, they make your voice say, you know, send it to this uh, account or whatever, buy gift cards, you know, uh, sometimes they do that. So I don't know. I don't know if it's anything to be terrified about, but it, it's kind of weird. And I, I think how this affects us just to get it more practically is, you know, from business and advertising. And I, I've seen some reporters use their TikToks a lot uh, for, um, you know, reporting and everything. Yeah. Uh, the story that I posted had an interesting, uh, they talked to Arizona Restaurant where TikTok really grew their business. And, you know, TikTok made them shine. I mean, they were failing before they got on TikTok. Well, if TikTok goes away, what happens to the business? Now, you can make the easy argument saying, well, you need to have more of a face than just TikTok. But you know how it works now. You know, some, you know, sometimes you, you do what you can do. And if right. TikTok makes you famous, man, you, you might be in trouble if TikTok goes away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's a growing popular website. We use it at the Tennessean uh, to promote stories. And, yeah. you know, it's you know, social media is a is a cash cow for a lot of people. Um, Are you on TikTok? I am. Yeah. What do you use it for? Eh, I mean, I posted a little bit, but you know, sometimes you just look for like trending videos, pet videos. Like I don't, I don't know, just like fun, fun little minute, two minute videos that you just, uh, you know, it's just a fun thing. It's kind of like, it's kind of like it reminds me a lot of, um, you know, on on Instagram, you ha- have like reels, things like that. It's kind of it's kind of like an extended reels where you get to see like live action stuff happening, which I like. I, it's funny. I was going to give John a hard time. Our frequent guest, John Reed, has come on a couple times recently. John loves TikTok. I, I mean, John's in his 40s, and John is, that might be his social media account. I mean, he's on a couple other places, but that's his big thing. Um, I'll tell you, Craig, one thing. Um, one of the things I like about my company is we've been doing a lot of video, just work and best practices and everything. You know, um, and I didn't know this. Obviously, um, you know, what they call it, vertical video is important. We have more of the up and down. But to get close, I've just learned on my uh, video editor, you pretty much have to scroll in on people. I've actually posted some of our videos here on YouTube and TikTok and, and Instagram. I mean, those have gone well, but it doesn't work where you see you and me sitting right. side by side talking. You've right. got to scroll in on uh, Craig or me or anything. So I'm trying to redo okay. stuff, but... Man, there's a lot to learn with that stuff. Yeah. It's kind of fun, but it takes a long, a long time sometimes to do it right. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so what happens? If, uh, I, I even know. Maybe we should talk about this too. How does TikTok go away? I mean, if I they ban it, it tomorrow, yeah. they they can't take away from your phone, right? No, no, not not technically. I know that there was some. I thought there was like maybe a South Dakota, North Dakota, one of those states might have banned downloading the app. But if you already had the app downloaded, yeah. you can keep it. So yeah. does that make sense? No. I mean, you know, why would that make any sense? But I guess they're trying to, you know, nip it in the bud, I suppose. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, if if they ban TikTok, you know, what do they get? You know, I, I guess the only thing that they could try to do is work with the you know, Apple, Google, and and try to get them to remove it from their play stores or their app stores. But I don't think that's going to happen because people want that app. And, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if a lot of people would migrate over to a different phone company. If, if those, if those play stores, or maybe someone would create a play store to allow that to happen. So, you know, it's, I think it's just, you have to live with it at this point. And I think a lot of the people that complain about it probably don't even use it, to be honest with you, and probably don't even have it downloaded on their phones. So, 
you know, I think I think it's a, a lot of people that are worried about things, and I, and I get it. There's always time to worry about things, but to me, it just seems like, you know, it, it doesn't see unless they can really tangibly say that there are data breaches or there are issues going on with people having TikTok, then I don't know that you can really police it that much or shouldn't really police it that much. Ohio just did something really interesting. They passed a bill, and I think it's law. It was part of the state budget, which just got passed. It's a social media parental notification bill. Mm -hmm. So if you have a kid that's like 10 or whatever, like, yeah, I have a 10-year-old. Um, with my kid's special needs, I don't think she's creating a Twitter account tonight or whatever. But, you know, I know a lot of young people sign up on their own for social media. Well, there's this talk now that they're making the social networks – find out and, and Craig that's so hard it's so hard to how do you enforce that you know what I mean I mean right. I could be 10 and if Facebook says hey you gotta be 16 or older what stops you from saying I'm 16 and you know uh, some of the Ohio officials are talking about it, they're like oh well they'll have to figure out a way of checking well how do you check you think Facebook Facebook's gonna call millions of people each night you know how old are you you know prove it to us you know and if I'm a parent I'm not sending birth certificates to Facebook, and you talk about <laughs> what information is good to send or not. I'm not saying that private information. I don't um, know, man. And, and, and maybe it's for the best, because I know uh, social media is kind of a crapshoot. It's a little bit dangerous and everything. But it's like anything else. Before we make changes, understand how that works and everything. And understand, too, is it more of just a fear of China? Because, right. again, you know, Facebook, we're going to talk a little bit later on about threads. Uh, a lot of people are yelling about threads because of their privacy concerns. Well, do we excuse that because it's an American company against TikTok because it's a China company? What are they going to do? Well, you know, same stuff's happening here. I mean, I, right. uh, I don't know. I mean, it's got to get regulated somehow, but I don't know how you regulate it without being too obtrusive. I don't know, man. There's no real answers here. Yeah, I don't. I, there really aren't any answers, at least anything that's clear and worthwhile right now and i i just think you you kind of just got to let it ride at this point don't you i mean you, you just kind of yeah kind of have to hope that things work out and, and just really i mean hey so with my work i mean i edit a publication i do a podcast i help out with a church communications thing i mean there's reason for me to be on social media but even lately, if I can't be on social media for a while, I can't be on social media. I mean, I still have accounts everywhere, but mm -hmm. if I can't check Twitter two hours a day, oh, well. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's kind of where I'm at. Um, the thing two weeks ago where they said you're limited in the number of tweets you can read and everything. Uh, right. The first day I heard that, I'm like, whoa, what am I going to do here? After a while, I'm like, you know, I haven't looked at Twitter that much today. I survived, and I'm probably a better person. Yeah. Right. I, I still use a lot to promote stuff. And I still use a lot to keep up with what's going on. But, you know, figure out your limits, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's, you know, I, I probably use Twitter a little bit more, mostly for work purposes. Right. Whether it's tweeting my stories out, tweeting coworkers' stories out. Obviously, I like to I like to look at, you know, what's trending, things like that, news, sports, entertainment. But, yeah, I mean, there I, I probably use Twitter a lot less than I used to, I would imagine, you know. Yeah, you know, I could definitely, I, I definitely get what you're saying. Um, hey, let's move on. We're going to go back to social media a little bit later. But I wanted to share this story. I thought this was really strange. Uh, Kentucky Farm. Uh, somebody found a, it's called the Kentucky, Great Kentucky Horde. They found 800 coins dating back to the Civil War era. Um, and these are in decent condition. They're gold coins, uh, $1, $20, $10. Um, they're saying it could be worth millions of dollars. Um, you know, Craig, this is one of those, it, it's got to be one of those once in a lifetime finds. Yeah. But it makes me think, are we missing out something, man? I mean, you know, we just talked about not having time. But should I be, like, going through my grandma's attic or uh, something just to – I mean, are we all missing stuff like this? That's a good question. I, I, it's hard to know because you just never – you never really know what's what's valuable these days, you know. And I think 
in a lot of ways, it's it's sort of in the eye of the beholder, you know, where some people might think something's worthwhile and other people might not. And it's, you know, and that's okay. But I've always been curious, like, you know, just how does, how does stuff become valuable, you know, and it's a supply and demand sometimes, but, you know, you, you kind of go through some of your old junk or your old stuff and you're like, wow, all of a sudden this, uh, you know, this thing is valuable and, you, you know, sometimes you got to look it up and that's one of the beauties of it though, is, is at the very least you can, you know, look to, you know, look to see online what something's worth or whatever, which is always ha- you know, helpful at the very least. But yeah, it's, it's kind of strange, you know, not really for sure knowing what exactly you're looking at when you maybe go through a bunch of pile of junk or whatever. And, you know, I was, uh, back when I was younger, uh, my family, I used to get starting lineups, the old Kenner starting lineups, uh, loved those played with a lot of them have some that are still in the box. And a lot of it was, you know, I like to play with it. You know, my, my brother and my mom, and we were all kind of collecting and, you know, thinking that we were on a gold mine. And at the time we were, cause you know, you get the old Beckett books and they would say like, this is how much a card's worth. This is how much a starting lineup figure is worth. And we used to be sitting on sort of a small little gold mine and, you know, years later, I'm like, oh, yeah, I still have these starting lineups. I wonder if I should uh, try to cash them out and, you know, make some cash. No, they're not worth a whole lot these days, which kind of sucks. But, you know, at the time, I, I mean, at the time, I, I kind of cared. But at the time, I also was probably more inclined to, to care about playing with the starting lineups. But it was uh, it was interesting, to say the least. Yeah, I heard keep them in the box. If they're in the yeah. box, it might be worth something depending on who it is. But. That's about it. I mean, the crazy story I had, um, I really got wrapped up in the baseball cards when I was a mm-hmm. early teen, like 12, 13 years of age. Yeah. And my dad was a baseball guy. So my dad shows me he had the 1959 Topps baseball set. Okay. But what he did was, and again, it's 1959. Nobody was thinking about condition with baseball cards and everything. Get this. He cuts off the bottom part of the card. Oh. And I'm actually looking at a picture of the 1959 top set. I think, I don't know why he did this. It, there was like a circular picture of the baseball player, mm-hmm. the name in lowercase letters at the top, and then his position and team at the bottom. For some reason, he cut off the team in the position at the bottom. So he had the whole set, but he cut off the bottom part, and he glued them into a scrapbook. Which, and again, now it's ridiculous, but back then you might say, wow, that was kind of cool. You know, yeah. you could show it to your friends and stuff like that. I'm looking now at eBay. I'm seeing prices for the whole set as high as 10000 bucks yeah. uh, tonight in decent condition. Uh, worthless. I mean, some guy bought them off us for like 10 bucks when we were at a baseball card show, but right. man, that was the thing. And, you know, it was my dad. And, and, and again, he didn't know better. And, geez, if I was – Alive in 1959 collecting baseball cards, I wouldn't know either, but yeah, kind of a crazy story. I mean, any of that stuff anymore, it's got to be in good condition. And with these uh Civil War coins, it was buried before like this farm was attacked during the Civil War time, so it was in probably really good condition, which which will make the value high, you know. Right? Um, it's funny, it's funny because we we talk about value of things and. You know, I, you know, obviously one of our friends of the show hasn't been on a while, but Chris Rupp from Rupp's Comics oh, yeah. in Fremont. You know, obviously I would I would do stories on his uh, expeditions to buy comic books from people. And, you know, sometimes you just never know what you're going to get into. Now, sometimes, you know, you, you get some advance notice of what you're going to get, get into. But, you know, a lot of that, though, is past books. And I always ask him, you know, how how does anybody know what's going to be popular, what's going to be worth a lot of money in the future? Because there's a lot of people that buy comic books, but a lot of them are, are reading them. And, you know, and obviously, much like they would have done in 1929 and 1930, they would have been reading the comic books, the, the detective comics. And, you know, at, at that point, you didn't realize you were devaluing a million dollar book because it wasn't worth a million dollars at the time. And I, I've always been enamored with how value happens with comic books. 
because books books that are out there today they don't have quite the value unless they're first edition of yeah. you know introducing a character or whatever but years down the road they could be worth much much more money because they might have introduced a side character that became super popular and you just don't realize it until years and years ago you know years and years go by so I, that's always one thing that i've always talked to him about uh, when i did stories on him in fremont just about understanding today's value of comics which isn't the same as you know a 1974 fantastic four superman or whatever that's that's a little bit more rare but it's also important so it's not just about the rarity of it it's the importance of it as well yeah same thing with books First edition generally mm -hmm. sell better, yep. but it's still got me in good condition. And yeah, yeah, you know, shame on my family. We never <laughs> was great in condition. <laughs> it was we were hard on our baseball cards and books right. and everything else. Uh, made it tough. So, uh, what did I talk a little bit about threads? We talked about this last week. Uh, when we taped this last week, it was literally an hour old. So yeah. we were just kind of learning about it as we went on. Craig, you're on threads. Yeah. Um, Here's my brief assessment because it's still kind of way early in the process. I like how more people are getting on it. I think we've talked about a lot of these new social networks in the past where you don't see anybody you recognize on it, especially like Truth Social and some of the other stuff. People are more on it, but I'm still not seeing a lot of interaction on it. Mm. I am impressed, though, like some main media outlets and some main yeah. people are on it where I didn't see that before. Yeah, Instagram... You know, it's based on the same algorithm algorithm as Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's got to be chronological. That's the thing that bothers me. Uh, Instagram doesn't have a chronological feed. Neither does Threads. So yeah. I'm intrigued by it. I think it eventually could get Twitter run for its money. I, I'm still not sure if it's there yet, but I'm hearing they're working on fixing some of these issues. Yeah, that's. I'm sort of in the same boat with you. I like it, but it's not really capturing me right now. And I think a lot of it is because, A, there's no desktop threads just yet. Hopefully that'll be something they do in the future, like you have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, but I, I will say that it's harder to, like, find, like, trending topics like you would on Twitter, where you can go to the search and you can just see what's trending. Whereas with threads, if you go to the search you essentially just find people that you can follow, which is great. But I think like being able to kind of tangibly see what's trending without having to type it in yourself, because you might not know what you're looking for, but you're looking for trending stuff. Well, you can't really know what trending stuff is trending until you see it. So I think that's the one issue that I have with it. And that's probably, it, it just, it just seems like more bland of, of an interface, but like you said, it's it's in its infancy. It's probably something that can grow, and it you know it really does kind of remind you of Twitter, and it kind of reminds you a little bit of Instagram. And I think there's there's a future for Threads. It's not it's maybe it was competition for spite, but it seems like it's competition that can stick around though too. You know, once this builds up, the million dollar question that people want to have, like Facebook, and that's a meta product too. Uh, even though some people think Facebook's kind of out, um, you know, we everyone still gets a lot of traffic from Facebook. Um, Twitter still is like 1% for a lot of um, pubs and everything. I'm wondering if threads can eventually, and, and I'm talking maybe five, 10 years down the road, if it's still around, can that get up to be a, a more significant, um, what do you call it, traffic driver than Twitter is? I mean, Elon Musk will tell you that. Everyone is clicking on links on Twitter. No, nobody is. He's wrong there. Um, I wonder if more people start clicking on threads. Because, Craig, at my company, uh, journalism company, we're already having discussions on what to do with threads. And I think one of the initial conversations is, yeah, I mean, we want to talk about journalism. We want to talk about how good it is. But do you use um, threads kind of more like an Instagram base where you're showing pictures? Maybe you're sharing a link. But are you using more of that than just hoping that a bunch of people click on it? Because I think a lot of places aren't sure what, like when I'm talking more mainstream companies or, or teams or organizations, uh, is it more of sharing your pictures than sharing links? I don't know. We're still trying to figure that out. Right. 
Yeah, it's, you know, I think for me, it's, it's, I don't think it's as easy, you know, when you click on someone's profile, it doesn't seem like you, you get, you know, with what Twitter would give you, which is, you know, you've got media likes, thread, you know, tweets and replies here. You just have threads and replies. So, you know, if someone posts a picture and you, you know, say, Hey, I, I posted a picture, you go see it. Well, you're going to hope that you can find it because it's not going to be easy to access. But, you know, again, those are some of these, small bugs in its infancy that are minor, you know, minor, you know, qualms. I, I, I really think that they're onto something with this. It, it does remind you of Twitter. It looks kind of like Twitter and it's going to give you similar ways to express yourself like Twitter does. So it's so far I've liked it. It just, it. I think I'm kind of waiting for them to get the bugs out. Well, it was funny when Twitter first came out, I mean, it was a game changer in terms of, man, if you replied to something, if it was a famous person or not, it didn't take big attention. Yeah. I got to be honest with you, Craig. I'm, I'm getting more replies and stuff now on my editor. I don't know what to do with some of these replies because it's not really trolls. It's just people that are fussed up about something and you want to respond, but you don't know how to respond to, to help people. Uh, I ran the story. Um, you know, Lordstown's up in our coverage area. You know, they've had a lot of stuff going back and forth with the uh, factory up there that was making cars. Used to be a GM, now it's a Endurance, and Endurance just declared bankruptcy. So I shared the story about, hey, this could be a factor in the 2024 election. The picture that came with the story was a picture of President Biden. I had this guy yelling at me in a bunch of tweets like, why did you use President Biden? Well, uh, as the picture came with the story, it really had no <laughs> political context or anything. And it, it, it's just funny because you don't know how to respond to some people sometimes when you get a bunch of responses like that. You know? Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's easy to respond and you should. And then sometimes, you know, err on the side of caution. Yes. Yes. I, I'm learning that every day <laughs> with uh, being there in 2023. So very good. Um yeah, so yeah, let's keep talking about threads in the future. Uh, see where that's at. Um, yeah, I, I'm intrigued by it. I, I will tell you, anytime you do social media, um, I do personal social media to pr promote stuff. I do social media on behalf of Mahoney Matters. It's almost frustrating because you're getting more networks you got to worry about. And um, the thread seems a little bit more legitimate than some of the other ones that have come out. But it's like it makes your job harder. There's more stuff to look after every day. Ugh. Yes, yeah. That's that's the one downfall, I guess, is just the extra added thing to worry about. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we got a lot of stuff to promote. So let's take a little extra time. Uh, what's happening in Tennessee? And I'm Craig, I got jealous. I don't see all of your links on social media, mm -hmm. but I think it was one of the uh, love shows. Was it Love Island? <laughs> Yeah, Love or? Island USA. Love Island USA um, have a story today on a Nashvillian who uh, was cast. And uh, interestingly enough, I did a story. I forgot that I had done a story in March, which is why I got the uh, sort of the bouncing email to me saying, hey, there's a Nashvillian on uh, Love Island. Uh, because I'd actually done a story where they, uh, the, the producers or the casting directors had actually come to uh, Nashville to, to seek out talent for their dating show. And uh, here we go, fast forward a few months later, and we all of a sudden have a, uh, a Nashvillian that uh -huh. will be uh, appearing on the show. So we'll be uh, rooting for her, and uh, it looks like we'll probably be able to get a chance to talk to her as well once her time on the show is over. Those are always my favorite. Like, wherever you work for, if a local person is on, you know, I'm, I'm sure either you or somebody else will be watching live as they go on. You write the recap of how they did and everything. <laughs> That's it's, always yeah. fun. Yeah. And it's funny because Nashville seems to be like a good destination for casting for these types of shows, whether it's a love show or Big Brother or The Bachelor or whatever it may be. You know, they, they seem to, it seems to be a good location for casting, which makes sense because you have a, a, a melting pot of of races and cultures and people that are from all over all walks of life that live in Nashville. So it makes it a, a very uh, desirable casting area, I would imagine. This has got to change. And uh, we're planning on sharing this with Mahoney Mary. So if you're listening from the Mahoney Valley, 
I want to apply for reality shows. I want to cover somebody up there. It's not well, a reality show. It's it's funny it that you should recently. ask. It's funny you should ask because I will. I almost kept it, but then I had I had to go back and look to make sure. Oh, it was right. So Marco Donatelli, who is twenty two, who will be on this show, is actually originally from Youngstown, although he now lives in, Bo- in Boca Raton. So. Oh, email me, please. Yeah, you may want to pick it up. Marco Donatelli, 22. At first, I had to double take because, you know, Youngstown. And then um, I wrote it, and then I I look back, and it says that that's where his hometown is. He's now from or living in Boca Raton, Florida. So, you know. But, yeah, you might, you might, we might, both of us might have some uh, connection here with Love Island USA Season 5. Well, if you have the press release, send it to me. Uh, because I, I think I'm going to need to get a hold of the PR person there to try to connect. I will do that. Wow. I, uh, Craig, this is so exciting. I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I am smiling more than I ever had. This is fantastic. So uh, go Marco. This is great. Yeah. Good thing I brought that up. That's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. I wasn't, wasn't even thinking about it when I was writing it today. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, Chris might like this. We have. It, it was interesting. And um, – I uh, interviews pending for tomorrow, so I'll talk about once we get the interview and we do a story. Um, but it's always interesting being an editor, or reporter, and I've been a PR person, so I've been on the other side of this as well. Yeah, you, know, you go for your emails, and everybody's pitching you stuff. Um, the problem with some PR people is they'll randomly pitch everybody in the country on a story, and they yeah. have nothing to do with your coverage area. Well, it was interesting. We've got a really intriguing story coming up. I was slated to talk to this person tomorrow. Uh, but when I was pitched on the story, hey, you want to talk to this person? Okay, where are they from? Mm-hmm. Uh, the peer person gave me the wrong country. I'm like, okay, I, oh. you know, I need somebody in this particular area. And it, I had to ask three or four questions. I'm like, man, I'm wasting my time, this person's time. It turns out that that person was actually from our coverage area. I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. Right. So sometimes it's hard to kind of we call it connect the dots for people to say, yeah, all right, yeah. are you from our area or not? So and I think and I sometimes think it's hard to weed hard. out some of those, you know, because you get inundated with some of those, you know, pitches from PR firms. And I you know, obviously this this kind of came about because I had been pitched in March about them coming to Nashville to do the casting, but obviously you know, we wouldn't have written about this new season had there would not had there not been right. someone from our area. But you know, certainly, um, you know, it, it was it, you know it was kind of serendipitous. It all worked out, and and obviously, you know, Nashville's the an entertainment mecca of the United States. So we get a lot of people that come in and try to cast you know Nashvillians for reality TV or whatever it may be. And in this case, it it kind of stuck. So. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes. And, and that's the thing. You don't want to like automatically delete something from these PR firms. Cause you just never know what you're going to get from them. And it might be something worthwhile. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Oh, I see Marco there. Marco's all excited. So <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Um, yeah, he earned a reputation for being unapologetically brash, yeah. but he's fond of the game of being pursued. He wants somebody family-oriented as a celebrity crutch as Summer Ray. How about that, Craig? I, Craig, you got me excited, man. I love writing about reality shows and yeah. the local people are on it. So All this from is the great. old town of Youngstown. So how about that? Yes. Yes. A lot of tattoos. He's got a nice tattoo of his mom. Uh, uh, man, yeah. what a family guy. Yeah. You go, Marco. That would be great. Um, and he's still in Florida because he's studying to be a chiropractor down there. So that oh, makes, that makes a nice. lot of sense. I was thinking, like, you know, what brought him to Florida? Because I, I I remember him being younger, and I'm like, what brought him to Florida? Well, there you go. He's studying to be a chiropractor. Maybe uh, maybe our Nashville girl will will get with the Youngstown guy. She she did say in her bio that she she loves men with tattoos. So, oh wow, Marco might might check off some of those boxes there. If they get married, we'll be covering their wedding. How about that? That's <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I think Love Island was originally on Fox, right? And then CBS. Yeah, CBS. CBS. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it used to be on like five nights a week in the summer. I know everyone's looking for their summer programming, but that was just like Yeah. Well, I, I do know. I do remember it having like a lot of episodes because I wrote the story earlier in the year and then I thought I, I thought I I thought I remembered it being on CBS, but I wanted to go make sure and I, I looked at the episode log and there's just like hundreds of episodes, like a like hundred and some odd episodes for five seasons, which is a lot especially with last year being the first year on Peacock. I don't exactly know how many episodes they did, but I know that it wasn't like the normal standard, like, you know, you would get 25, 30 episodes in, you know, or, or 40 episodes in some of these reality shows. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Well, I'm seeing a lot of tweets about him, so. He's got an awesome Instagram page and here's why. Okay. In his Instagram reels, it has me, articles, Redcon One, Companion, and Outside. So he spells his first name on his uh, reels, where you can click on to see his reels, which is pretty fun. Uh, right. One hundred and seventeen thousand followers, and it looked like he played football at the University of Akron. So he's a oh, he's wow. a zip, yeah. Um, I, I did a Twitter search for him. Um, okay. Kind of a quote that made me laugh a little bit. Yeah, I got enough to write a story for tomorrow. I'll put it this way. There's a lot of info about Marco out there. Uh, too, yeah, too many women are hitting him up. They're throwing themselves at him, and he just doesn't have the time to date. Mm. He's so hot, it's a bird. <laughs> <laughs> that was my problem, Craig. Yeah. So yeah. hot, it was such a burden. It's always, always an issue for themselves. us. Isn't yeah. It? yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> that makes a laugh. I need that. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, this is for Shaggy Pohoi, man. I just got to give you some stories from there. Um, yeah, you'll read, I'm sure, about Marco as early as tomorrow on Mahoney Matters. Um, you will also, uh, we've got a uh, interesting health story uh, coming up. Like I said, we haven't done the interview yet, so I don't want to spoil it. Uh, but a local woman who's very involved in the upcoming vaccine. Um, which is very interesting. Looking forward to helping share that story. Uh, the Trumbull County Fair is starting, Craig. Uh, we yep. wanted to cover the fairs in our area. Uh, Trumbull's pretty interesting. Um, they're very into milkshakes up there. Um, I, I saw I was, your post, and I got very jealous of that. I'm a milkshake lover, so... Well, my wife was stunned because she's like, why didn't you have a milkshake? And I guess I could have asked for one or bought one. I just didn't think of it. I... Uh, what we're trying to do, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to be there for every day of the fair. There's six days in the fair, so I did six small slices of mm -hmm. stories. We're, we're running one each day. Right. Uh, we did one about the rides that also came out today. We uh, talked to some queens and uh, some other parts of the fair. And uh, so I was kind of in a – I, I got to get a bunch of stuff done in a hurry. But, no, the milkshake people were interesting. They claim it's the best milkshake in America. That's okay. kind of a bold claim. Very bold, but you know what? Hey, why not? Be confident. I, Love your stuff, you know? I, I will tell you, when I got there, I was talking to the PR person, and she's like, oh, what, what little stories do you want to put together? And I said, well, show me a unique fair food. Because I thought, like, we go to, down here to the Ohio State for a lot, and they always have, like, mm -hmm. fried, you know, like fudge or some weird right, stuff right, like right. that. I walked through the food places, and again, I got there just as the fair was opening. Um, not really anything super unique, but she said, look, everyone talks about the milkshakes, and I can share your web numbers. <laughs> it's going over well. People like reading about milkshakes. So, uh, very yeah, interesting. So, yeah. yeah, so we'll have um, stories, uh, some videos, little slices of the fair, and we're also planning on doing that later this month when the fair goes to Columbia County. And then the big fair up here in Youngstown, Craig, gets the second biggest in Ohio behind the Ohio State Fair, the Canfield Fair. That's the fair up in the Youngstown area. Okay. So check that out. We'll play on headed up there for that, too. Um, let me see what else we did, Craig. Uh, really sad story. Um, someone tied the dog uh, to a railroad tracks up in Youngstown. Uh, nobody saw it. Um, thankfully, a business guy uh, was walking by. Saw it, rescued uh, the dog. Uh, they're looking for who did it. Um, the business had a security feed, so they have video of the people who did it, but they're trying to find who they are and everything. Mm. Real sad story. Why would you do that? I don't know. Yeah. 
I, I, well, I will never get it. Uh, we also have uh, stuff, Ohio special election. Kind of a controversial issue, issue one, uh, trying to say what's the vote toll should be if you trying to do a new issue. Uh, that's coming up. We have information about how to vote on that early if you want to. Um, let's see, Craig. It's been a pretty busy news week. Uh, lots of interesting things happening. Youngstown, all carnage. It's the new ride at the fair. Uh, we talked about that. And probably the best name for a sports uh, bar, um, the, somebody bought a, a bar up in Youngstown. They're making it to like a Youngstown State Sports Bar. They're going to call it Glimps, kind of a short name of the Penguins name up there. Uh, so a lot of people are excited about that coming. So, yeah, so all kinds of stuff. Lori Morgan is coming in concert. I'm not sure if anybody knows a lot about Lori Morgan. And then, oh, Columbia and Columbia County. It's kind of a, known for a more conservative county, uh, but there's a group doing their pride event on Saturday. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people are excited and a lot of people are upset about that. So we're interested to see what happens there this weekend. Sounds good. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, anything, anything not work related we should promote. You know, like, oh yeah, you, you've got I'm sure some yeah, movie uh, stuff coming we're up. We're waiting on George, but hopefully we'll get back. We've got Mission <clears throat> Impossible, Dead Reckoning that just came out uh today uh, as we are recording. And I will be talking to Bob Garver for sure on Friday morning <clears throat> about Dead Reckoning. So I'm very interested yes. to see what uh along with some other movies that Bob will have been caught up on as well. So very excited to talk to uh, to Bob this week. Very good. Um, I, I've got Paul and Joe. Joe was in Spain for two weeks, but he messaged me, and he is back. Uh, so Joe will be back uh, with Paul. Uh, we'll have the Steelers show. It, it's a slow time for the Steelers. So we're uh, tonight, I think we're going to look at the draft class and talk about what's realistic, realistic expectation for the for rookies, you know? Yeah. Um, who, who do we think might start? What's you know? What do we hope they do realistically? I'm mean, obviously we, we'll all be Hall of Famers, but realistically, what can we expect out of these guys? And then we've got our goofy etc. show. We got some interesting topics tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> oh McDonald's Indonesia. Craig, we mm. should have talked about this too. They're having a wedding package. Where for two hundred bucks, you can um, get food for your wedding. It's McDonald's food. It's a bunch of different chicken stuff. And okay. yeah, I love McDonald's. So yeah, haha. Chris will love to have McDonald's wedding. Uh, but we're, we're going to talk about that. But also, if we had to do it over again, did we spend too much on our weddings? Mm. I, I'm really thinking that's. <clears throat> and I, I wish. And I, you know, I was young when I got married. I didn't know. I, I wish I could have talked to my wife and then talked to her parents and said, hey, can we narrow it down for you? And if you really want to give money, you know, help get started or something. Yeah. That may have been more than. Uh, and so we'll have fun, but we'll talk about some serious stuff with that, too. Um, there's an enterprise worker up in Cleveland that he got mad and he pretty much um, ripped apart the whole store. It was kind of wild. Hmm. <clears throat> um yeah, so be careful when you get fired. And I always say too, Craig, you're always going to run to people down the road, so don't burn bridges. No matter what happens. So I agree. Yeah, definitely. All right. Anything else, Craig? No, I don't think so. I think we uh, we covered quite a bit. Excellent. Um, you may be asking out there, uh, John, old friend of ours. Uh, John comes as often as he can. He was on vacation last week. He was tied up with a work thing, but you know, whenever John comes back, we'll welcome him. Uh, and <clears throat> so that's what, what we know about that. So, uh, for Craig, this is Chris, who I'm coughing. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody. Uh, we'll talk soon. <laughs>